In this conversation, we are going to speak about math, magic, and the relation between them. Before I started this podcast, I was, and still am, a magician. So I know what I'm talking about. Now, most magicians that I know don't know math really well, but my guest today is an exception. He's a mathematician by day and magician by night. Professor Matt Baker from Georgia Tech University is professor of mathematics, but he is also a very talented and gifted magician. In this conversation, we discussed what can be extracted from math into magic tricks. I know you will enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Before we start, let me tell you one thing. My name is Roy Yozovic, and in this channel, I bring the most talented and important and intelligent people from all around the world to discuss science, philosophy, religion, artificial intelligence, and much more. If you like this conversation, please consider subscribing, hit the bell button, and be part of this great community. There is lots more where that came from. And now, Professor Matt Baker. So, Matt, thank you so much for coming. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Nice to be here. It's an honor. And I'm. Uh, we are doing this interview from your, uh, uh, from your math office or from your local, or f- from your home? Yeah, this is from my home. Um, uh, my office right now is actually being packed up because they there's asbestos and they have to remove it so <laughs> i can't even go in if i wanted to today so to your left i can see the yellow uh, white books which are the math book and to your right i can see the magic books yeah that's right <laughs> okay so before we start about uh, about magic could you please describe a little bit some something from your current work in math Sure. Uh, So yeah, I'll try not to go get too technical because I'm sure most viewers aren't uh, professional mathematicians, but, um, you know, I've loved math and been, had some talent for it since I was a kid. But um, what's interesting to me is that, you know, as I've, as my career has developed, I've developed my own aesthetics and taste in mathematics and, invented some of my own, I guess, new fields of mathematics. And so now I sort of work on uh, things that maybe don't fit into traditional mathematical boundaries, uh, but they're the things I'm interested in. And I've managed to find connections between areas of math that maybe were viewed as kind of separate before. And that's kind of what interests me most. And so to give you one example. Yes, uh, this was a great teaser. Okay, I must <laughs> know something right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I like these connections. I like analogies. So, I mean, one thing I think about uh, is numbers. So I was trained in number theory. And... In number theory, there's something very interesting. So we have the integers like one, two, three, four, five, but you also have zero and negative one and negative two, right? These make up the integers. This is sort of what number theorists study are integers and various fascinating things about them. Um, We also have rational numbers that you can get by dividing integers, right? So in general, not every integer divides every other one. So three doesn't go evenly into seven, right? So, but we can still form three sevenths or seven thirds as numbers. They're not quite as concrete as integers, but we all have a feeling they exist, right? Like three seventh is a, it's a concept that we know what it means. And in a sense, it's, it's real, but there are also things we call real numbers. These are a bit more um, elusive, maybe from a, uh, uh, you know, ontological point of view, because pi is a number, it's a real number. We can't actually write it down in a certain sense, though, right? I mean, it's decimal expansion never ends, there's no periodicity, so it sort of goes on forever with no obvious patterns. So it's much less obvious what it means to say that that is a number. But we all accept, not all, but most mathematicians say there's such a thing called the real numbers and pi is a real number it's between three and you know 3.2 uh but what's interesting in number theory 
people have found other ways to fill in the holes in the rational numbers. So that's how mathematicians think about real numbers, is that rational numbers have holes. Um, pi is sort of filling in a hole that needs to be there because you can approximate it with rational numbers. 3.1 is a rational number, right? It's 31 over 10. It's close to pi, but it's not exactly. 314 over 100 is even closer, but it's not exactly. And a sort of limit of a sequence of rational numbers gives you something irrational like pi. But there are other ways to fill in those gaps and include uh, limits of rational numbers because it turns out that the key thing when you want to fill in holes and form something like a continuous number line is you need a notion of distance, um, how to measure how far two numbers are from one another. And we have a conventional notion that we use. A you know, minus B? Yeah, A minus B is the distance from A to B. Yes. Um, and it seems like the natural choice um, in some sense it is, but there are other choices that work very well mathematically. So, for example, I could say that um, I'm going to measure distance by how many powers of three divide the difference of two numbers. So, one and 28 are close um, in this optic because their difference okay. is 27, which is which divisible three by power of three. three to the power of three. And so this is called the three attic metric on the integers, and it extends to a distance function on rational numbers. And the point is that, but it sounds, it but 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 it sounds like a very stupid metric. I, why do I need how many powers of three? Yeah, it seems that there is something more into this powers of three. Yeah, I know it seems very unnatural. Um, uh, but it turns out to be quite useful. And that's ultimately what mathematicians, I would say, care most about. And from some point of view, I think you could really argue that it, the p-adic numbers, as they're called, for each prime p, it doesn't have to be three, it could be any prime number, you can do something similar to this. You get a, a new notion of distance. You can fill in the holes with these things we call p-adic numbers that are allowed to go on infinitely. And um, they actually have many applications in mathematics, and they've really revolutionized a lot of things. They also make certain statements much more natural than they would be without periodic numbers. I mean, if I had a whole hour to just talk about math, I could explain more. But what I would say is that um, this analogy between real numbers and periodic numbers is always very intriguing to me. And... Um, it has a surprising number of, of uses in math. And so I think you learn when you study mathematics that you should be careful ruling things out as, oh, that that's not real. This is real. That's not real. You know, just like complex numbers is another yes. example. Square root of minus one. That's a lot harder to digest than pi for most of us. But By the way, it's not just real uh, versus unreal. It is useful versus unuseful because many right. unuseful uh, statements or, or, or theorems become very useful later on. So math is not about useful. It's just about is it consistent? But uh, no. I will reference a paper to what you just said, because it, again, mind blowing and number theory is beyond my capacity of understanding. You know, the 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 idea, if you write all the prime numbers on a, and they just join to a line, which absolutely fascinating. But let's go from math to magic yeah. and you yeah. uh, and you studies uh, and you study com combinatorics and combinatorics is if i have a deck of cards and i shuffle the deck of cards how many different uh, arrangement how many different permutations do i have for a deck of, uh, of cards in this case 52 factorial and my question is since it is 52 factorials the probability to get four aces on the top is very, very small. Therefore, this is one use of math. I can tell you that by the ordinary uh, way things work, I couldn't have in advance have four aces on top unless it's magic. So what's your take on, on combinatorics versus probability versus 
I beyond, I am beyond combinatorics and probability because I have the four aces on top. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you're, I, I think I know, you know, what you're, what you're getting at here. It's, um, it's interesting. So in magic as a performance art, and I should say that, um, I'm interested in magic from a number of perspectives, right? So I think one thing that's interesting to me is how it interfaces with math. And we'll, we'll talk about this, I'm sure. Um, but also I think magic just as a, an art form and as a, a tradition that goes back thousands of years and has a rich intellectual history is just very interesting. And yeah, one of the things that comes up when you perform magic, when you study magic, is, you know, you wonder what is magic anyway? I mean, what, how, how do we even define that? Uh, and is a coincidence, is that magic? And I think that's what you're getting at. And I guess it depends on the... On, the, um, on your presentation. Right. So, you know, magic is, is more of... Uh, it, it's not a well-defined thing, but, you know, it, it's an art form that we use to create a certain feeling of astonishment, wonder to get people feeling like they've experienced something impossible. But of course, impossible um, is also hard to uh, define. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, it's possible that someone has a machine that stops gravity and something floats. It seems unlikely, um, especially if it's just some random person on the street. But, you know, maybe we can imagine scientists uh, have done this uh, in some lab and it's possible. So, um, nowadays with the electronics, you know, there are many things that used to seem impossible, but now we could imagine them. We don't know sometimes if that's the method or not. So, but to me, this is kind of irrelevant. I mean, people know I'm a performer and not doing genuine miracles. At least I think most people, um, know that and believe that. And I, uh, but you know, you have to sustain the illusion as well. I don't start out trying to convince them that everything is trickery because that's not, fun and interesting. What's interesting is a sense of mystery. Like, I'm going to show you things you can't explain. Um, so to get like a to zero question. proof, a zero proof knowledge. So I'm going to prove you that I know for, for example, I know your first girlfriend name, but I'm not going to show you how I do it. This is exactly the notion yeah. of zero proof knowledge. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So there's these, yeah, zero knowledge proofs. Uh, zero are, knowledge proof. I'm sorry. Right, right. Are really, um, yeah, interesting things. I, I wrote a blog and my math blog, there's some post about zero knowledge proofs if people want to get an introduction to that. It is quite interesting. Um, I just came to these conclusions that what we do in magic or in mentalism is zero knowledge proof. I'm no. going to prove that I know your girlfriend name, but I'm not going to sh to tell you how I did it. But what you said is very interesting. You said this is not about math, and and what my point was that the connection between math and magic is not in the combinatorics. It's not in the okay. What is the probability? Because if I give you a deck of cards and you shuffle the deck of cards and you show the four aces on top, this is not the probability of one divided by fifty-two times one divided by 51, etc. We know it's magic, okay? And let's go from this notion. There is a great Eric Mead presentation of the invisible deck called a Order Out of Chaos. Order mm -hmm. Out of Chaos. And I think that this is where we, we can combine more intrinsically magic and math. And the idea is that you can create chaos in a way that it has still an order. For example, if I do a riffle shuffle, okay, this is chaos. This is not a perfect riffle shuffle, but I can say something about the structure. I remain, something from the structure, from the initial structure remain. Could you please elaborate on the order out of chaos or order in the chaos? Sure. Yeah. So let's let me let me go back and say one thing about your first question, and then I'll, I'll come back to the order and chaos. Um, so back to the probability stuff. I think um, there's a useful concept, which is to distinguish in, in magic to distinguish 
you know, actual odds in the sense of mathematical probability and perceived odds, right? What the audience feels the chances of something happening are. These don't always agree because we as humans are, uh, you know, imperfect in judging uh, judging probabilities. Uh, in fact, I, I know you you had at some point Daniel Kahneman on who studies the how we can actually quantify people's irrationality and their the flaws in the ways our brains perceive risk, for example. But this is very, I think, closely related to how we perceive odds of things happening, right? And so magicians use this to their advantage all the time, whether they uh, know they're doing it or not. And so to me, um, could you give the, could you please give an example of what you just said because this is so profound I do it all the time this is so profound could you give an example yeah sure um so you know if I okay there are some mentalists who uh make their you know living doing tricks such as they hide an object in one hand you know maybe a coin right and or th sorry they have the audience member hide it in one hand and then they tell them which hand it's in okay Okay, well, that's obviously 50-50, and I think people correctly perceive that that's 50-50, and by itself, um, it's not that uh, impressive, you know, amazing. But if you do it five times in a row, right, the odds of getting that right is 1 in 32. But how do people actually perceive that? And I think that's an interesting psychological experiment to do. There are people that have researched this. Um, but it, the presentation has so much right to to do with this. So I think, for example, if you really build up the suspense and you really make it seem like your whole show depends on getting this right, then even if it's 50 50, would you really build up that much tension if there was a 50 50 chance that you would miss it? Um, you know, as another example, I don't do this at all. I would never do this, but there's common brand of magic tricks where you mix up, uh, there's like a bag with a, three bags or three cups and one has a sharp spike inside and the other two don't. And you smash your hand down. My, um, friend, on... my friend made a big mistake. Right. <laughs> in Israel, using his yeah. hand. And I saw the snuff video. It was uh, very bad. Yes, it's awful to watch. So this is why nobody out there should do, try this i i don't do it because my entertainment is not worth um <laughs> anyone risking their their bodies for but um you know having said that this clearly is one way that people can heighten the sense of uh not just you know danger i mean people are excited by danger but it also makes it seem okay one out of three chance of getting you know, a big gash in your hand uh, feels very different from guessing whether a coin is heads or tails, even twice in a row. So what, I, what I'm saying is that um, now you take it to card tricks and finding a selected card is one out of 52. Even that, in any card at any number presentation. And this is what I right. do all the time because in any card at any number, this is a great trick by David Berglas. You say in a card and the other spectator say a number for just like that, seven of hearts and 25. And I count to the 25th card and the 25th card is a seven of hearts. And when I prefer it, I say you had one out of 52 and you had one out of 52. So one out of 52 times one out of 52 it's one divided by 2,704. I do, I, I do it yeah. in Hebrew. You, you right. <laughs> but nevertheless, no, it's one out of 52. That's so right. It's, exactly. it is one that's out of 52. That's a perfect example. Yep, that's a perfect example of the difference between the actual odds and perceived odds. I think the perceived odds in any card and any number are greater than the actual odds, which is one reason that... Uh, that's one reason it's a good it's a good trick, um, right? Is because uh, it feels somehow more impossible than it is, and of course, then there's <laughs> trickery that makes it much better than one in fifty two. Um, what well, it's one hundred percent if you do it right, but uh, but yeah, that's a great example where um, just through the presentation and the framing, one one can make things feel more impossible, and that's interesting to me. That's more psychology than mathematics, but. But it's interesting. But then the presentations often do use math to try to point out how impossible it is. So many Rubik's Cube tricks, right, where 
uh, someone solves a Rubik's cube or matches another Rubik's cube uh, that is not solved, but they match the exact pattern, right? The exact odds of this are one in, I forget, 53 quintillion or something yes. like that. 43, yeah. 43 quintillion. 43, 43 by 3 Rubik's cube. But again, I'm still, I'm feeling that we are not there yet. We just use math as a presentation or as an excuse. And we have math that is inherently in the magic. So yeah. I want you, I, I, so I want to us that. to yeah, focus yeah. So to on this, the right. math that, and we can start if you want with the Gilbert principle or the shuffling. The idea is, for example, that if I shuffle a deck of cards eight times perfectly in a row, the deck will come back to the original state. And this is a mathematical feature of a deck of cards, and you can apply this math into magic. I'm not going to say how, but this is math intrinsically lies within the magic. Right. So there are uh, a couple of concepts related to shuffling that it's important to distinguish between. So what you were just talking about is um, a perfect shuffle, right? Um, this is something that, uh, yeah, many, many of us who work with cards can do uh, after some practice to perfectly interlace uh, the cards. And um, if you do that eight times in a row in the correct way, then uh, you get back to where you started. That, by the way, comes, it's closely related to ideas in number theory. And so I talk about this in my classes that I teach. Uh, why eight, for example, you know, why not, why isn't it 10 or 20? But let's not get into that right now. Um, because I think where you're going with this is that, so that's a sense in which a certain order is preserved by perfect shuffling, right? We do it eight times in a row, we get back to the original order. And as you say, there are, mm -hmm. there are many interesting applications of that fact. But there's another fact which is um, related to the Gilbreth principle. And this says that even imperfect shuffles preserve a certain amount of structure that is not obvious. And so I think you started to allude to this. I also have a deck <laughs> of cards. Um, you can so, prepared. Yeah. So these are alternating. Normally, you wouldn't show this if you were going to demonstrate the Gilbreth principle. But I will, I will show you that these are alternating. Um, and so if I uh, split this deck like this, uh, and give it now. If, I'm not going to give it a perfect shuffle, right? I'm going to give it a um, like you did. Just uh, try to do this for the camera. Just a riffle shuffle, uh, not not perfectly interwoven. Where is Stuart it's James? Perfect. Where is Stuart James? <laughs> yeah, it looks um, random in a certain sense. This is not random. For example. Here I have one black card and one red card. One black, one red. Black and red. These are in a different order, but it's still one black and one red. Black and red. Black and red. And this persists throughout the entire deck right now. Let me just year. recap, because this is mind-blowing. When I take an alternate deck, red, black, red, black, and I cut it somewhere in the middle, I'm not going to tell everything and yeah. i shuffle and a riffle shuffle in any way i want i can do a, a, a good riffle shuffle i can do a clumsy riffle shuffle it doesn't matter the cards every two cards that i take from from the top will be alternate will be red and black red and black and this concept or black was, and red or, 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 or red and black okay and when you show the deck Sometimes it will be red, red, black, red, red, black. So you don't see a consistent order, but in this chaos, you can see, you can spot order lies beneath. Now, you can formulate this notion in a, in a, in math. But yeah, I right. bet, and I think that you bet also, that Stuart James, the originator of this concept, didn't know how to formulate. He didn't came. He didn't come up with the notion of group theory or graph theory or I don't know how you formulate this concept. It was like a spark of genius, 
What do you think? Well, so I think so. Stuart James certainly did related things, but this principle is attributed to Norman Gilbreth, um, who was actually a mathematician. So I think he did know how to um, state it in a formal way. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there are many related principles um, <clears throat> in magic that many of which are yeah just discovered because people play with cards. They try to create magic tricks. They play with patterns and they sometimes find really interesting things and they may, there's different ways to understand patterns, right? You can understand it in a very formal, rigorous way, the way modern mathematicians do, but that takes some training in, in the, the right language because it's been thousands of years that mathematicians have been refining. How do we write down um, and prove uh, theorems, uh, uh, such as, you know, the statement that no matter how you shuffle, how clumsily you shuffle, um, blah, 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 what you just said, you know, they will, each pair starting from the top or starting from the bottom will have one red and one black card in it. That's a theorem one can prove, but you can also understand it and use it without understanding the proof or caring even about the proof. But to me, all these things are related. I mean, the more you understand conceptually why that's true, the easier it is to apply that principle in a non-standard way, right? If you really understand what's going on, you can maybe vary it. Um, and so to me... Not just for cows, for example. That's interesting. What's that? Not just for cows. You can get the gist of the Gilbert principle and apply it to different domains. Yeah, that's right. So... There are many magic tricks. I mean, I'm sure there's, yeah, in the Percy Diconis Ron Graham book that I know you you have a copy of, um, they talk about how the Gilbreth principle is related to various other things in, in mathematics and science, not just, you know, it's not just a card magic principle, but um, it also has many applications within magic. It's, and yeah, I use it in contexts that have nothing to do with cards. Um but to me, that's very interesting is that what do you do once you see that there's a pattern? It's very counterintuitive, so people will not understand this. So you have the potential to mystify people, to make them experience something that feels impossible. Uh, but how do you get the most out of that, right? You need a, a presentation. Ideally, whatever procedure is involved, shuffling, dealing, um, should be justified in the context of the presentation. So these are just really interesting things for me to think about. And it uses different parts of the brain. It uses the creative, theatrical, so-called, you know, uh, uh, right-brained activities, as well as the kind of left brain analytical things. And for me, that's the most interesting kind of work is is to break down the barriers between these these things. When you read a mathematical trick, and I my I think my most favorite math trick is from, I think, Semi-Automatic uh, Card Trick Volume 4, Modern Day Miracle from uh, Marty Kane. This is a great trick, and it, it, it's very counterintuitive, and I don't know why this trick works. So I can reverse engineer it, and I don't know how he, I, I think I know how he came with it, but when you study a trick that is counterintuitive, you always say, just a second, let me just see what happens underneath. Let's see, okay, this is great. Let's see how can I, I how can I apply this the gist of the magic? Okay? That's right. That's that is my approach. Um I, I know that's not everyone's you know approach to to uh, magic and that's fine. Um again one can do the tricks and maybe even come up with original variations without understanding the the guts just like you know you can use technology without knowing how everything works um but uh and i don't you know i i draw the line there i mean i don't know how my iphone works and i care at a certain it would be interesting if somebody could explain it to me in a way i understood but i'm not going to spend my whole life trying to you know understand how the circuits in my iphone work i have other things I want to understand and I've chosen, but what I do like to understand is, yeah, if I see, uh, if 
I read a, a magic trick, for example, that um, it's based on a really counterintuitive principle, um, I want to understand why it works. And so, yeah, one of the first things I'll do is I'll just sit down and work at it until I understand it to my own satisfaction. And there's different ways to come to that understanding, right? One is sometimes you can just think about it and by pure thought come up with it. Other times requires testing out special cases and simplifying the problem. And this is something mathematicians do all the time. I have a concrete example, Matt, in my head. It's the 21 car trick. It's your version of the 21 car trick, okay? Mm. And many people perform the 21 car trick. It, it's the well, most famous non-magician trick. And I saw that you just like open it, <laughs> like open the stomach of this 21 trick. And, 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 and how can you start? I can, you know, perform the 21 card trick with the card face up or the card face down and say, and I can trace the located card. But I don't think that I understand why it works every time. Okay, this right. is a, a, so so and so called above, so and so called beneath, and then I need to redivide it. But I think that you have special tools to think in in a why term, not just in a how term. Yeah, uh, sometimes it, I think it's just for you know my own. Um uh satisfaction my own intellectual amusement to you know it's not always useful to understand things at a deep technical level but but sometimes it is useful and um you know you don't know in advance and this is the same with math research i mean you don't really you can't just say in advance i'm not going to learn that tool because that's not going to be useful I, how do you know that right um you have to just kind of learn a lot of things and then later you see now if you have good intuition um based on experience you can sometimes say that seems very likely to be useful so i'm going to learn it or that seems probably like an isolated fact that i could safely ignore and my life won't be the worst for it um so i try to refine that intuition um but yeah so the 21 card trick is something that there's actually interesting mathematics behind it martin gardner was very inspirational to to me growing up. Uh, wrote about this in his book um, Mathematics, Magic, and Mystery, and in other places about um, uh, some interesting math that underlies this famous card trick. And then, um, you know, the question is, yeah, what what are you going to do with that extra knowledge? So I've come up with a couple applications that I think are are nice. I mean, they're every all magic is context specific so uh i don't perform that trick you know at a um children's birthday party <laughs> right um but in the just way, at sorry, the martin gardner convention this is just a yeah, trick for the martin gardner gardner. convention it's extremely good so uh it depends where you find yourself as to what kind of uh demonstrations will be will be useful so it's not one size fits all but but yeah, I find that with the people I tend to interact with who are smart and who are sometimes, you know, uh, mathematically informed and and um, talented, that uh, you you need something to engage people's um, curiosity. And I, I just try to find things. But yeah, it's motivated partially just by a sense of fun. I mean, math to me puzzles and math and games and magic are just very fun and they're full of interesting things to think about and so many people think of these as uh as difficult and as scary and i just try to dispel that as much as possible by trying to make it interesting and appealing and yeah that's all could there is to at some level could you give me please another example of a math concept that has been applied into magic because we know the Gilbert principle and we know the shuffling pattern that if you take the cards and you shuffle them eight times per and you perfectly shuffle them eight times etc but what another really mathematical principle have been injected into card magic for the last in the last 100 years 200 years 
Okay. Well, you know, the 21 card trick that we talked about is sort of another example of that. But yeah, there are many. Um, so uh, there's something I'm not going to explain this here since this is for non-magicians as well as magicians. But one of my <clears throat> close personal friends and mentors was Simon Aronson. It was a great magician. Um, he passed away a few years ago. He invented something called the undue influence principle, which I think is the best new mathematical principle in magic in the last, say, 50 years. Uh, and it's a way to uh, have spectators. Um, you know, I, I I won't do the whole uh, trick because it's really better in person. And it's yes, yes. So just... With- just the gist to get the idea and if you have the Simon uh, uh, Simon Aronson book the Simon Aronson approach and you can just check it there right so he has several books um I think try the impossible is the book where he debuted this principle uh I do encourage anyone interested in mathematical magic to check that out uh but the idea is that you um uh one spectator just lifts off the some number of cards and holds it against their chest another spectator does the same um they look at them they put them back the magician hasn't touched anything at all yet they've really s- freely cut the cards looked at cards put them back um now the magician spreads through the cards in the act of talking and perhaps does something I won't say but you know it looks very innocent and um and now the I could actually arrange for those two cards that the spectators are just thinking of to be at specific locations in the deck that I want. So for example, I could have a prediction in advance that says your cards will be at 19 and 41. Or I could even have you name my spectators name numbers out loud and I can make the cards appear there with a very minimal amount of me touching anything. And this is quite impossible seeming and miraculous and... Uh, Yeah, it's a it's a genius idea and you know I understand it um uh, because you can prove it works using algebra but I don't know how someone would come up with that and I did I interviewed Simon just like you're doing here I did an interview with him once and I asked him this question how did you you know come up with this he had a very interesting answer I won't try to paraphrase the whole answer but you know it's he spent a month and playing around with spreadsheets and really he's not a mathematician he just he has a very good analytical mind and he wanted he had a sense this was possible and as soon as he had the idea that it was it should be possible he pursued it until he figured out how to do it and I think that's the secret to a lot of science and math success is to um, just have a sense of what's possible and then to have the dedication uh, to see it through right and of course you Maybe 90 percent of the time um, it doesn't work, but if you have the tenacity and you have the right level of intuition and the right level of knowledge and skill, sometimes you you hit a home run. <clears throat> I think that what you said is a great example. And when I think about it, uh, Danny de Ortiz recently published semi-automatic weapons. and in his semi-automatic weapons, you see many, many uh, concepts and math concept it's not math it's just like a I if you think about math and you have integrals and limit and then I I don't know the the, the the very complex analysis of math no 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 it it is math but it is very simple and disguised math and when right. you see Danny de Ortiz it's like wow this is great this is great this is based upon math and But it's not a very heavy loaded math it, it's it's not number theory it's right just numbers and counting okay <laughs> but but it's so terrific would you agree yeah Danny's great um everyone should watch his recent appearance on Penn and Teller's fool us it, it is you know, yes <laughs> Jay just do just get me the prize just get me the reward <laughs> yeah he's very confident too that's right but uh you know uh the I think you point out something interesting that I I was also going to um, make a point of which is that uh, you know just like I was saying before what is what is magic anyway well what is math um, I mean basic arithmetic one plus one equals two is is math counting you know seven cards um, 
is math at some level. It's not very interesting or deep math to a mathematician, but so to an extent, many card tricks or other magic tricks are based on math, but it almost feels silly to say that if the math involved is counting to three. Um, I don't consider that math in the intellectual sense of the word, right? But on the other hand, yeah, there are many math ideas that are so complex and so involved that, of course, there's little chance they could ever be used in an entertaining uh, magic trick because, I mean, there's just too big of a gap between the complexity and the specialization needed to understand the math. And If you have ever case. seen the magic trick of Eric Demain, Professor Eric Demain from MIT, this is what Matt is talking about. Yeah. <laughs> there is a very, very, very high and abstract math concept. And then we squeeze a card trick to prove this concept works. And wow, this is a very, very strange card trick. Right. So... I do there's I have room in my own um life and repertoire uh because I'm in different situations. I have room for both of these kind of things. I like uh magic tricks that illustrate interesting math concepts, even if as magic tricks they're not great. Um, I don't do them in my shows for the public. You know, the other night I did a magic show and there were some. Um, elected officials there and it was for a nice holiday party for a charity and okay I wouldn't do a trick that a boring trick that demonstrates a math principle there but I would do it in my classes right if it teaches a concept I'm trying to teach um so and then on the other hand there are magic tricks that use very basic math but they're great tricks and I do those too I guess what I'm particularly fascinated by is Is where the math is actually pretty interesting and the trick is really good and Simon Aronson was a master of the intersection of those two things and that's a very um specialized space I would say there's not so many great magic tricks that are based on really interesting hard to understand math principles and when when they do exist I'm I'm very interested in okay them. so let's go go from here to Danny De Oort is called this series semi-automatic and this is not because it is because we have a book series called semi-automatic contracts by Steve, Steve Beam. Beam right yeah yes and this is a great 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 set of books and in I think in volume two or three I, I really don't remember he said that to say all semi-automatic tricks are based on math is just like saying all slight of end magic are based on the past. This is a very old slide. And the idea is the semi-automatic tweak is not a slight of hand. It's not a vanishing. Let me show you something. Boom. The card here, the card is not here. Semi-automatic is more procedure. There is a procedure. Many people, you know, think about like the Australian deal when you down under or, or count, uh, count and add the digit, etc. Uh, but what is your take? On semi-automatic countries because I know that you are skilled in sleight of hand okay and before I uh, let you answer I will quote from Ken Weber maximum entertainment mm -hmm. and he said no professional mentalist will ever tell you to think of a number and add the digit to get to a number and if you don't agree with this concept just leave the book and I would and I will argue that That no intelligent magician will tell you to think of a number and add the digit and and what's your take on that? Yeah, so I, I I'm largely in agreement with the the quotes that you that you read. Um, you know, again, we're talking about show business and entertainment here, right? So uh, <clears throat> there are things that may be mathematically interesting that, You can recover this digit by adding those and okay, but that's belongs in a classroom probably to illustrate a mathematical concept and not in a show where you're trying to entertain audiences that aren't specifically there to learn uh, math. So um, so to me semi-automatic magic is is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, It's more accessible than difficult sleight of hand, right? So I think one of the beautiful things about magic is that um, almost everybody gets interested in it at some point in their life. Um, maybe it only lasts a short amount of time. For a few of us, like you and me, 
it lasts a whole lifetime. Most people um, get interested briefly, but it's cool because so many people buy magic kits or they read a book or they watch a video. And so it's genuinely important, I think, to have an array of tricks that can be done by beginners, um, but are actually interesting and impressive. So semi-automatic, I think of as sort of meaning that you don't need a lot of difficult skill um, to just do the mechanics of the trick. Uh, it sort of works itself in some way. So just like if you had an apparatus that makes a trick uh, work uh, on its own, um, you know, a, a box that has a secret compartment to vanish something, uh, there are card tricks that sort of work like that too. You just follow a procedure. You put this card on the bottom and the next one second from the top. And, and then you can think of telephone tricks, all the tricks that you do over the telephone. Juan Tamariz is a great book called Ver verbal magic. When right. it, it, uh, if I can perform a trick over the telephone to someone else, the trick cannot lie or cannot rely on sleight of hand because the spectator over the telephone is doing all the procedure. Right. And so uh, I wouldn't say all semi-automatic magic can be done over the telephone, but I think you're right that all yes. the converse is true. All, <laughs> all magic that can be done over the telephone yes. is, I think, not based on yes. sleight of hand. Um, so the, uh, yeah, so, so semi-automatic magic, semi-automatic magic is, is, um, useful and interesting for a lot of reasons. And, you know, one is it's, it's easier to do so. Um, it's more accessible, but also it, it's applicable in situations like you just described where sleight of hand would not be an option. It's also, I think, uh, you know, in some ways more bulletproof. Okay, I mean, if your sleight of hand is perfect and you're the best in the world, then maybe no matter how hard someone stares at your hands and no matter how uh, many times they see it, they won't see anything. But most sleight of hand magic depends on some kind of misdirection. You know, if you're actually really watching carefully or you have a videotape and you rewind it or you see it many times or from the wrong angle, you know, a lot of magic doesn't look as good in that way. Semi-automatic magic, for the most part, is um, really nice because the, you don't have these problems. It's not angle sensitive. It's not, nobody's going to detect what you're doing because it's not based on misdirection. So I, I find this quite valuable um, because I don't do much magic that's angle sensitive, for example. I just don't um, work enough in the real world and I don't practice enough in front of mirrors at different angles and videotapes to be confident that if I'm just in a party with people gathering around, nobody's going to see what I'm doing from any angle. You know, I think you need to kind of really just do magic full time to get that confidence. Um so I prefer things that are bulletproof because of other reasons, right? Like the principles I'm using for the most part cannot be detected uh, just because they're not physical things one can accidentally see. I mean, that being said, I'm not afraid to use sleight of hand when it helps a trick. And often I'm in situations where I am quite confident that the move I'm doing is invisible because... I'm performing it on a stage or at a table in front of an audience and I know my angles and I know that there's a few moves I've practiced a lot and can do fairly smoothly. And yeah, so I'm not afraid to use these. It's not that I'm a purist about it, but I do think uh, it's if you have a choice, if you can get the same exact effect and you can either do it with no sleight of hand and no risk of anyone seeing anything or you know, by using a great deal of skill, why not do it in the semi-automatic way, right? But there's a big if there. The If you can get the same effect, well, in many cases, sleight of hand can get you things that there's no other method that can really accomplish. And then I think people sell themselves short or, you know, aren't reaching the full potential of what they're doing if they insist that everything has to be self-working um, and they don't want to add other ingredients to it. To me, if the goal is to be fooling and entertaining and mystifying, then use all the tools you have. One very important point regarding semi-automatic is, I think Steve Beam said, think of all the tricks that fooled you, you know, magician fooler. There are semi-automatic tricks. If, you, if you're going to uh, take two cards as one, as we say, there are, I think, 
very few magicians who can do it in a way that another magician won't even be suspicious about the procedure. And you, you know what I'm talking about. But if you think about semi-automatic, about the work of Juan Tamarie, is about the work of Len Long. Len Odwin is not a good example. But Juan Tamarie and Danny Jorossi, you say, wow, this is the only thing that I've been fooled by of semi-automatic countries. But again, I'm a, I'm a magician. So maybe I'm more sensitive to see or to spot those weak spots. But I we with your permission, I want to go to the last uh, uh, phase of the of the conversation. Yeah. You uh, published a, a magic book called the Buena Vista Shuffle Club, and this is a great book. And I want to read something from this book. It's it's not a magic trick, okay? It's from page 11. Five things you probably didn't know about Matt Baker. One, everything. <laughs> Two, I was once in a contest on a TV show, Jeopardy. I didn't win, but I came in second place and I got the Luke's Backyard Barbecue Smoker out of the deal. I studied poetry with a poet literary of the US and once won a national writing contest. Like the Unabomber, I have a PhD in math. And like the Unabomber, I tried to keep my beard recently well trimmed. And this is an example of a beautiful, engaging, fun writing. And I think that this writing is, we see it more often than not in magic books. Steve Beam is a great example, but we have other, other writers who write very well, who write in a fun way. And reading your book is such a great experience. And Thank you. which leads to when we write in research for Google Scholar, when we write research paper, we don't write in this fun way. And my question is, in your opinion, why? Because I think this is a, a huge mistake. The science is all... <laughs> Is, is hard enough. What's your take on that? Yeah, it's a great question. And so, <clears throat> right. So I do have, you know, uh, 50 so uh, academic papers I've written. Um, because I wanted to get them published, I have to conform to certain standards of the field, right? So, you can't quite be funny uh, too uh, fun, <laughs> I, for lack of a better word, and get published in certain journals. And yeah, in one level, it's it's a shame. I mean, there are math journals that are geared more towards uh, a broader audience and engaging, and these have much looser standards. And then you can write more. And so on my math blog, I sometimes am playful. Sometimes I'm quite serious and by the book just because I'm trying to get across some idea and I don't I don't have a ton of time to play with it from a creative writing point of view. I'm just trying to communicate some idea uh, in a straightforward way. But yeah, it's it's very important. So in my classes, I would say I use this more in my you know lectures, presentations, classes, blog. I use these as ways to be more creative in the writing I do professionally to publish in journals. I try to play by the rules of our society. Um, but you can still, there are still ways within those rules. So I wouldn't joke about the Uta bomber in one of my math research papers, like I do in my book, but um, even without such things, um, I also say in the book, somewhere in the introduction, I think I, I talk about how uh, I used to hide my interest in magic from people because I, you know, I was afraid they wouldn't take me seriously uh, if they knew how much time I spent thinking about magic. And then, uh, you know, I confessed to someone that I was close to that how much, uh, you know, intellectual energy I put into magic tricks and felt like a a, a confession that <laughs> me and uh when he started listening to me saying, you know, I have a confession to make, I, I write in the book that I thought he was, uh, he probably thought I was going to say I'm addicted to pornography or something like that. <laughs> yes. um, and he was relieved that it was just, I like magic tricks a lot. 
Um, and he assured me that's not the worst thing that, you know, human beings um, do in their, in their <laughs> free time. <laughs> in, but in the spare time. Yeah. So, you know, so I, I'm open writing. I, I make jokes like this in, in the book. Okay. So I wouldn't talk, I wouldn't mention pornography again in one of my papers or the Unabomber or any of these other things I joke about. But having said that, what I was going to get to is you can still, there's still ways to write clearly and be inspiring in an academic context. And I do wish more people would care about this and think about it. So the ways in which I do that in a, in a, you know, more uh, scientifically acceptable context is that um, I'm always very careful to write nice, long, detailed introductions to my paper, where if by the end of the introduction, you haven't been convinced that this material is worth caring about, <laughs> then I've either failed or or I've correctly saved you time and you shouldn't read the paper, right? I really hate it when people assume everyone should be interested in their work and they don't bother to put it in context and say, what, what is new about this work? Why is this interesting? Why should you care? Um, and how you is this push? So you, you basically push the cover letter into the introduction. Yeah, exactly. So I really think you have to um, do a sales job. And I don't mean that in the in the dirty sense of like a used car salesman, you shouldn't do a bait and switch. But you have to convince people their time is worthwhile. I mean, why should anybody if there's anybody still listening to this interview? I mean, why do they care? Well, hopefully, we said some things at the beginning that got them interested, mm -hmm. and they find this valuable. But if you're still here, I value your time and and you know um I know Roy does as well and and so we try to be professional and interesting about this because your time is valuable you and there's many things that you could be doing and learning about so in my papers I, I don't want to assume that I'm the greatest uh, thinker so everyone should just be automatically interested in what I have to say um I have to earn that every time I write a paper and so you know I think you have to captivate your audience uh at the very beginning so the introductions i guess what i'm saying in a in an unfortunately long-winded way is that introductions are really important and you have to capture people's attention and tell them why they should invest the time in what you have to say i didn't publish 50 papers yet but i try to let the reader go with me hand by hand so from the introduction to the period I just help him because this is heavy stuff. So I want to do, just like you just said, the maximum I can do to help the reader go through the pace. I, I, I recently uh, read a, something from the science editor, and he said, if I need a dictionary to find a word in your title, I guess that you needed a dictionary too. So don't come up with great, some bombastic words. Okay, just, okay, just leave it. And you said something about spare time. And it let me think about Arturo de Ascanio, which was the mentor of Juan de Maris, one of the greatest magicians in the 20th century. And he was a lawyer by his profession, but he almost never, never spoke about being a lawyer. He was all into magic. And he said, when I get up, I have like the deck of cards in here and I have the deck of cards at the door. And he was all obsessed in magic. And you can read what he, what he, what and how he writes about magic. And my question is, what was the percentage? It's not just, don't just give me a number, but you're a math professor and you're the dean of, just a second, I just wrote it, <laughs> the dean of a uh, of a uh, of a uh, dean of faculty development okay so this is heavy stuff and how much of of this is a spare time and how much of it is a, a true obsession as you say in the buena vista shuffle club yeah well this is what i struggle with uh often, you know, to be honest, is that um, I don't have enough time in the day to do all the things I love doing. I love every part of what I do in my life. I have three kids that I love and, you know, uh, my family. 
I love mathematics. I like teaching it and doing research uh, and writing about it. I love magic, uh, both performing it, coming up with new tricks, writing about it. Uh, and my dean job, well, it's a little less of a passion and more of something <laughs> that university needs and it pays well. And, you know, I get to be kind of important. Um make big decisions but you know it's nice when you have a certain amount of experience to give back and and to do things people uh need need done um and you know so these things run into each other though and there's not enough time and i have lots of students that are phd students and other things and i i like corresponding by email with people so yeah it's a problem um I spend as much time as I can on everything, but I run out of time and I fall behind. So uh, what I like to do is um, just force myself to set aside some time for everything, maybe not as often as I would like. Um, but, you know, just about every evening I uh, read a, a magic book or magic magazine before going to sleep. And at least once a week. Usually what are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? I am reading <clears throat> um, a book someone sent me. I can't say who because it was sent to me in confidence, but about uh, memorized deck magic. So this has to do with um, things you can do if you're able to to memorize, you know, the order of lots of cards in a deck. Um, <clears throat> you know that my memoir's deck is, uh, I learned it by the six hour memoir's deck by Martin Juyal. Mm -hmm. And this is a great deck. And almost no one speaks about it, you know, just you usually people speak about, you know, the Aronson stack and the Tamari stack, but the yeah. Juyal stack is a yeah, great, you... great, great memorized deck and no one speaks about it. Uh, yeah, I, I know of it and uh, I don't know many people that use it. So that's that's interesting that that's the one that you came across. But yeah, I mean, I, I haven't learned it myself. I, I have no opinion on it, but yeah. There are this is a whole subculture yeah, yeah, no, okay, magic, no. right? um so that's one thing I've been I've been reading is to give feedback to a colleague um on this and I'm flattered that I'm considered you know uh, enough of an expert now that someone would would ask me for my my opinion on a, on a book that's going to be published the other thing I'm reading is um a history of two-person code acts so this is mentalism more you know your world my mentor Simon Aronson in addition to being one of the great card magicians of the uh, 20th century I would argue was also did a two-person code act with his wife um I did which, know yeah was phenomenal you can find videos on at wow least one I didn't on know YouTube. I really didn't know I know they sat down in you know with a uh, a uh... Ed Marlowe at the Chicago, you know, is uh, mm -hmm. David Salmon and and all and Bill oh, Malone, yeah. but he didn't know nothing about the coda. Yeah, wow. so it's a whole part of his life that uh, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of magicians don't know about. It was great act, really, really. He was prouder of that than anything else that he had actually come up with in his uh, magic life, and. Um, so I, I I'm I'm good friends with Ginny still his widow and I talk to him about this a lot and now I'm reading um, a history of this to try to understand sort of what people were doing before Simon and Ginny um, entered the scene it has a very long history and this is actually interesting for me both because I find it entertaining and amazing when I've seen it but also you know intellectually um, it's one thing to say, okay, we understand that it's possible to transmit information mm. verbally, but um, it almost well, seems like an information theory paradox when you see it done well. That yes, you feel like what, is no way. The, what is the most efficient right. way? And, we, and it, this is exactly, it's like the Shannon gap. It's like the, <laughs> Exactly. So Shannon, Claude Shannon, yes. the father yes. of modern <laughs> information theory, tries to quantify how much information can you convey yes. with a minimum, you know, number of... Yeah, definitely, of definitely. And yeah, the, the co uh, two-person codex has a certain feel to it, like that to me, which I find intellectually interesting and resonates with what I know about, yeah, Shannon-style mathematics. And so although, of course, it's it's different in that it's it's 
again, based on its entertainment and psychology and practical human, uh, what's practical for the human brain as opposed to a purely information theoretic thing. But you don't so read I, it. I think the perceived odds, it's back to uh, what we talked about at the beginning, yes. that um, the actual information theory content of what you say and the perceived amount of information you can transmit by saying certain things are different. And I find this quite fascinating. But you, when you read like, the Simon Aronson act, you're not going to do a two-person telepathy art. So this is just like, you know, for leisure time, or you, when you read it, you say, okay, let's find something, find some concept that we can apply later on in different scenarios. Yeah. Um... Because you are not going to do a two-person telepathy art, I, I assume. Well, who knows? Um, <laughs> Maybe. Um, it's something I've thought about. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, we, my wife saw Simon and Jenny perform this and was, that ah. was her favorite thing she's seen of all the magic shows she's seen and mentalism. Oh, so you made conveyed a your, okay. So you've, so, okay. So if I mean, your wife it, is on a maybe, uh, Okay, okay. Right. This is a different way. But again, when you read something, it's not just leisure time. I read in a way to learn for learning and apply this in new... Because in the Buena Vista Shuffle Club, you said something beautiful. I said, I want to perform my original tricks. Right? I came to the phase in life where I want to invent, invent the tricks and perform my tricks. And this is hard because sometimes when you read someone else... This is a great trick, Bill Malone. He has yeah. he has great commercial tricks, and when you say no, 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 I'm not going to take Bill Malone tricks. I'm not going to take Quantum Heuristic. I'm not going to take Danny Diotis, and you know that you uh, love Danny Diotis. I'm going to take my tricks. I'm going to take my original material, although your pain audience doesn't care. It really yeah. doesn't care, and That's this true. is a. a, a This is something very strong to say, to state out loud. I'm not going to take any trick. I'm not go just going to invent or modify tricks. Yeah, I do. I do perform some tricks that were created by other people in, in some cases, but I try to at least find ones that most people aren't doing, right? So if something is, many magicians do it, I'm not really interested in that because I... I just don't think um, it's helpful for me in terms of my career or just for the audience that may have seen one of another magician do this, then it's disappointing. They say, oh, I just saw somebody do that like uh, six months ago, the same trick. They even used the same uh, presentation. <laughs> the same presentation yes. it, it pops the whole bubble in, in my view, you know, when they say, oh, he's, he's just doing something he learned out of out of a book in uh, Israel many people many magicians doing right now the staple gun uh, routine where you mm -hmm. know you, you shuffle the staple gun and this is a great routine by the way by the way this is my staple gun oh, oh, over there and I just quit performing this routine because you can see you know every magician or every mentalist takes a staple gun and <laughs> okay I'm not going to do it yeah so I, right I I think that um It's just something that we all eventually have to find our own unique performing style. And you can't really be unique and stand out if you're do, copying um, what someone else does. But that said, there's so many great ideas out there. I think we also have to have some humility. And of course, I'm, I can't personally come up with original material that is strictly better than everything <laughs> all magicians and mentalists in the last several hundred years have collectively come up with so um you get your own up, twist yeah so so yeah, you take your it's own not a it's not a uh yes. it's not black and white right you can you can do something in a different way just give me my two cents i just want to add my two cents to yeah. this week matt thank you so much for your time and i ask all my guests two final questions one all my guests are mega productive Last week, I had Noga alone, and he, he, he just keep publishing 
and publish and publish and publish and publish. Yeah. And my first question is, could you share a tip about being productive? Because you also are productive in the field of magic. You have this great masterclass series and you have the book, which is a great book, by the way. And okay. you also have a very rich Google Scholar page. Okay, <laughs> And you publish many papers. And could you share one tip about being productive? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I could always become more efficient, but uh, myself, but, you know, I, I do, I have learned how to be more efficient. And so I would say one thing is uh, to really focus, right? Nowadays, everything in life, Uh, leads us if we succumb to it to distraction uh people like to multitask and to some extent that's inevitable and it people feel it's synonymous with productivity to multitask you know to be writing an email at the same time as you're in a meeting at the same time as you're you know reading the next uh notes for the next thing you have to do and sometimes that's unavoidable but to be really productive in the, in an intellectual sense to come up with new ideas, To think of how you want to express those ideas and to actually make the time to do it, you really have to shut out distractions. So I think setting aside blocks of time for me, you know, 10 minutes isn't enough. I mean, I need several hours of focus. No internet? Time. No internet? Uh, yeah, I mean, in if I... If I really feel like the internet is interfering, I'll turn that off, but I will. This is will an airplane mode. Just you. Yeah, and yeah. Paper. Put everything in airplane mode. That's right. And just just work and find a quiet space to work. I actually, for some weird reason, prefer to be in like a noisy space, but with headphones. So I'll go to like a cafe where there's ambient noise, but I'll put headphones on to block out that noise. I don't know why my brain likes that, but it helps keep me awake, but also... focused and find a space you know where you work well find what works you know for your posture for your uh, for your brain to stay awake and for your mind to be refreshed that coffee shop for some reason you know helps me focus I think and then um, and then just shut out the distractions and uh, as much as possible and I that's what I miss my Dean job makes me Makes me too busy with emails and um you know I it's unfortunate that it's harder than it used to be to just put my phone in airplane mode for several hours because I often have something I need to respond to but it takes a it takes a toll on the mind and so for those people out there that have the luxury of shutting out distractions don't if you are not a Dean me. if you're not a Dean you can do yeah. it exactly and it takes a toll on your mind I think this is a great way way to put it and the last question is I usually say give me one book to change your mind or, or you know change your perspective but in your case could you please name the best and I know that this is a bad question but who cares the best magic book that you have ever read mm. I know yeah. it's a I, 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 I know it's an unfair question but you know well I I will yeah it, it's uh I'll answer in a personal way because I I could cite several books from from the Canon of magic that everyone would agree are great books um but I would say from a personal perspective book that changed my oh. opinion of magic and also changed my life was um try the impossible by Simon Aronson that we talked about before and I It's not the book if, if there's beginners out there wanting to know where to get started in magic I wouldn't say this is the magic book to go start with but I would say uh it accomplishes some remarkable things and to me it's a great great book it lays out this undue influence principle we described before explains why it works many different applications beautiful presentations for it and then goes on to To many other in interesting uses of a memorized deck that we talked about some and it's just full and Simon Aronson's writing is very precise if you follow the instructions you will know exactly how to do the trick but he also offers variations he tells you why it works he tells you how he thought of it he tells you why you 
shouldn't do this thing instead of this thing. And it's and very, this was your in, your inspiration in the Buena Vista Shuffle Club when at the end of each week there is like this very funny discussion. This is your inspiration. The try from Tri is impossible. Well, from Simon Aronson's writing in general, and also I would say John Bannon's writing has influenced me. His book, um, well, his books are great, but uh, um, uh, there's one in particular, I'm forgetting the name now, but um, there are a few writers in magic that have captivated me. The, the other one I'll just mention, Tommy Wonder's uh, Books of Wonder are great because he also has thoughtful essays and um variations as well as just tricks <clears throat> these things together got me thinking you know i don't want to write a magic book that's just tricks that, that's just not interesting i mean there's so many tricks out there that's not what the world needs more of um what we need is kind of a thoughtful approach a philosophy and an entertaining presentation of it so that you enjoy the whole process of getting inside someone else's mind and And Simon's books more than anything convinced me that this was doable <clears throat> but he has his variation sections are more like just standard footnotes you know end notes where he says um you could also do this move this way <clears throat> using this uh principle instead of that one and I thought that's fine but let's see if we could do it in in a more light fun way. way light <laughs> this is so funny what you had them this is so and funny. so i came up with fictional characters that actually are <laughs> discussing my tricks and criticizing them in some cases yes. and saying let's do it know, with, let's do, do it, it with the memorized deck <laughs> uh so it was just to like we were talking about before you know you want to got to make things fun and accessible and you want to hook people so i thought that would be a hook Also, I was an unknown author um, at the time. You know, it was my first magic book and people in the magic community didn't know my name. Now, a lot of them do. So I guess I did something right. And I think having a hook is important. So that was the way I decided to do it. But I was definitely inspired by the thoughtful uh, self-reflection of, of folks like Simon Aronson. This is great. This is so much great. Matt, thank you so much. Have you ever been in Israel? One time back in when I graduated high school in 1990. So it's a long time ago now, over 30 years ago. It's like a Taglit uh, thing, you know, to just go. To... Are you Jewish? I'm Jewish. Oh. And I, uh, that was actually at the Weizmann Institute in oh. Rehovot. And where the, where Max Maven spent one year of his childhood. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. His father worked for the Weizmann Institute and he spent one year in Israel as a grown-up. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, so something to uh, have in common with Max, that's great. But uh, yeah, I went for a science research program that they had for kids that had just graduated high school and I spent five weeks in There and included one week in the desert where we did some science experiments uh, in the Negev and uh, went on some hikes that uh, may be for your 11 a.m because it got may, too hot maybe for your boys bar mitzvah you can visit and I will be more than happy to host you in my university thank you so much it's been such a pleasure and such a mind-blowing experience speaking with you thank you so much for your time for your effort and for your great magic and math that i really don't understand <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much thanks for asking great questions inviting me to be here and yeah i hope this is valuable to to people that watched i know this is valuable <laughs> bye bye matt